So I have to say that I am more nervous about this talk than I am about almost every other talk that I do. And I, I, I talk a lot, um, but this one, this one's a, this one's different for a couple of reasons. First of all, um, academics are good at talking to other academics. We're not as good at talking to actual people. Um, and so I'm going to do my best uh, to to tell to tell the story that I'm trying to tell. But also the other the other reason I'm nervous is I, I'm not even going to be wearing my sleep hat for a lot of this. I'm actually going to be wearing my clinical psychologist hat. Um, and I tweaked a whole bunch of these slides about 20 minutes ago, or not 20 minutes ago, like right before right before lunch, after listening to some of the stuff this morning, thinking, you know what, I want to talk more about some of this stuff. So. Um, so managing your mental health. So I, I want to start with a couple of couple of thoughts here. Um, so this is some stats I got from um, some federal sites. Uh, more than one in five U.S. adults live with a mental illness. More than one in five teens have or or had a seriously debilitating mental illness. Uh, less than half of adults with a mental illness get treatment. Uh, the average delay between symptoms and diagnosis is eleven years. Uh, about half of the U.S. population lives in a mental health professional shortage area. Uh, Depression is associated with 40% higher risk of developing cardiovascular and metabolic diseases. Unemployment rate is over 60% higher in people with a mental illness. Uh, Depression is the second leading cause of hospitalization in people under 18, second only to pregnancy. Um, and depression is a leading cause of dis disability worldwide. Uh, and suicide is the second leading cause of death for people between the ages, uh, not just between the ages of 35 and 44. It's actually all the age groups between 10 um, and, and 35 and stays and it stays in the top five all the way to 54. Um, if it were an infectious disease, we would be mobilizing for a cure. Um, but mental health is still weird to talk about. Hopefully we're getting better. Um, and, I, and I actually wanted to start with this slide. There's a bunch of resources. There's a lot better resources now than there were, um, especially 988. 988 is amazing. Um, that's one thing that the current administration put into place. Um, it's been a huge game changer for community mental health where everyone now can just text, hey, I'm in a crisis and someone will respond to you. Um, it's amazing. A lot of people don't even know it. It's, it's the new 911, it's 988 for mental health nationwide. Um, a little bit about sleep and mental health. The I mean, the correlation between sleep and mental health is one of the most reliable in all of medicine, right? I mean, this is something we've known for decades. Here's a study we did um, in a population, in a, in, in a general community sample, not a clinical sample, where we looked to see what aspects of sleep disturbance were related to which aspects of depression symptoms. And we specifically looked at, was it the sleep part of the sleep complaint, the I'm not sleeping? Is it the daytime part of the sleep complaint of like, my sleep is impacting my ability to function? Or is it the, the perception symptoms, which are whether or not I'm sleeping at night or whether or not I'm able to perform during the day, am I satisfied with how my sleep is? Um, and what we what you can see is every item on the PHQ-9 was differentially related to different aspects of those symptoms. And um, th this caused a bit of, of, of ripples when we tried publishing this. It was really hard to publish because the sleep field didn't like the fact that the sleep part of the sleep symptoms weren't the most important part of linking sleep disturbances with mental health. It was actually the daytime stuff, um, which makes sense. The degree to which it's impacting your ability to function, that's really probably the bridge to, to mental health more than, like sleep itself does important things in the brain, but I don't think that's where the meat is in terms of being able to improve life. We did, we followed it up with just the same same analysis, but we used the GAD7 anxiety questionnaire. Um, same thing, we just repeated the analyses um, looking, and we can, what you can see is the daytime symptoms drive the relationships again. So if you're looking at the correlations between sleep and mental health, it's not just about not sleeping. It's not just about the sleep disturbance itself. It's about translating that sleep disturbance into a daytime dysfunction. And I, I wanted to present these data for you um, partially to help explain kind of what's going on. Um, this, are, this isn't narcolepsy data, but I think it applies. Um, 
Also, I want to talk a little bit about insomnia and suicide. It's a big part of some of the research we're doing these days, but a lot of people don't realize that insomnia triples suicide risk. Um, and it's not even just insomnia, actually sleep disturbances broadly, um, whether you look at insomnia, nightmares, um, other sleep other sleep disturbances, you, you see over and over and over again, this tripling of risk, somewhere in that ballpark, usually more than doubling, less than four, somewhere in that range. Um, and there've been multiple meta-analyses now. We have some hypotheses as to some common mechanisms as to why, but really, I, I want to drive home this point that, you know, this public health crisis that we have with suicide risk um, is, is linked to sleep in ways that, that are more than just depression. Actually, changes in sleep disturbance predict um, changes in suicide, suicide ideation better than changes in depression do. Um, nightmares. Uh, I wanted to talk, I'll just mention nightmares because this is something that a lot of people with narcolepsy are struggling with. And there's a whole literature on nightmares um, that a lot of the sleep people, we tend not to focus on as much, um, but there is a whole literature on nightmares that are tied to mental health experiences and are also independently related to, to outcomes that are important. Uh, and there are treatments, there, there are whole treatments for nightmares. Um, there's, there's sets of nightmare treatments, especially in behavioral sleep medicine. Um, here's some data. We, pub we, we presented this at the sleep meeting, but we haven't published the paper yet. Um, this is population level data looking at, so not in narcolepsy, but in the general population, looking at how often people are experiencing nighttime sleep disturbance and daytime sleepiness related to um, also experiencing suicide ideation. And what you can see here is these things are strongly related. And, it's, and, and after you adjust for typical covariates, it doesn't go away. Even if you're adjusting, after you're adjusting for the role of depression, it doesn't go away, especially for daytime sleepiness. Um, again, just wanted to put this out there to, 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 help, to help stimulate some conversation around this, that, that sleep and mental health are intimately connected. They, they're, they're hard to separate from each other. And people who are struggling with mental health issues often have sleep disturbances and people with sleep disturbances often have mental health issues. Um, one of the things that I think is going on and just a quick plug for some of our work. Um, so we have this hypothesis about why nothing good happens between two and five in the morning. Um, and, and it has to do, our hypothesis is that you have this combination of circadian and sleep homeostatic sleep pressure factors that are that are amped up in the middle of the night, which is why people who've been awake during the night when they haven't wanted to be, um, this isn't when you're making good decisions. Often you look back on the on the, the next morning and you look back, man, why was I freaking out about that? Um, and what you have here is the situation where you're primed to be cognitively and affectively dysregulated. Um, and what the, the, the issue is, probably happens to everybody, but when you have people whose sleep is systematically disturbed during the night, they're systematically exposed to this brain that's not functioning the way it's supposed to during the day. And we hypothesize that this is one of the reasons why it doesn't matter what kind of sleep disturbance you have, you'll end up having some of these worse mental health outcomes, that this is something that underlies all of them. Um, we also think that there's all, all kinds of other bad choices that people make in the middle of the night, like nobody craves a salad at two o'clock in the morning either. Um, so we just actually finished a study. We're looking at food choices around 24 hours too, um, looking at this. But anyway, I just want to plug this idea. Um, and that paper is freely available. I mean, it's, it's open access. So what about narcolepsy? Um, there's still very little scientific work exploring links between narcolepsy and mental health. Uh, this is despite countless patient reports that narcolepsy significantly impacted mental well-being in many ways. Um, the stigma of narcolepsy is especially a major source of stress. So this is, this is from a paper looking at um, the perceived stigma um, actually accounting for, for some of this relationship. Um, and difficulties with daytime functioning and health-related quality of life are common. I'm going to talk about that a little bit. So, so I found a couple of studies that actually looked at mental health symptoms in people with narcolepsy. So this is one by O'Hayan showing that um, compared to people without narcolepsy, people with narcolepsy seem to be screening positive for a lot of other mental health conditions. They're more likely to have ADHD, um, phobias, other anxiety disorders, other depressive disorders, um, 
And, and so this is a, another paper by Flores et al. that was slightly more recent that found essentially the same thing, that when you look in a population of people with narcolepsy, you're also more likely to find you know, depression, suicide ideation, anxiety disorders, PTSD, panic disorders. Um, I like this figure because it really just shows you if the line on the bottom is people without narcolepsy, this is the, this is the percentage um, elevated likelihood that people with narcolepsy are gonna show up with these things. Um, even things that are relatively uncommon, even if only a few people say have OCD, the likelihood of someone with narcolepsy also having OCD is, is just that much higher. I, I think that that this is something we need to talk about, um, that this is an issue in, in people with narcolepsy. Um, there's a, a meta-analysis I found of 31 different studies. Uh, when they pooled together the data from the studies, essentially the prevalence rate they came up with was about 32%, that about one in three people with narcolepsy probably has depression of some kind, or at least has a history of it. Um, that was from the meta-analysis. Um, and when they looked at, at studies that had um, a narcolepsy and a control group to look to see how much more likely depression was in the narcolepsy versus the control group, um, it was, again, more than tripled the risk. Um, and, and I'm not just saying this up here to, A, tell you stuff that you probably already know, uh, and B, to, to say, like, you know, look how bad this is, I really want to, the reason I want to say this is, is actually for two reasons. One, to potentially validate what people are feeling with that and maybe not talking about that this is a thing. This is something that I think is important with narcolepsy and I think we need to be studying this more. And as a psychologist, um, I, I am I, I'm appalled that our community hasn't even gone into this much. But we need to. This is why I'm here. This is why for the last couple of years I've been anytime, anytime they tell me to do anything, I just say yes. Um, because this is this is the sort of conversation we need to have more of. Um, there's 30 studies that have showed that narcolepsy is associated with impaired quality of life. I don't need to tell you guys that. I mean, that's why you're here, because we're we're as a patient community, you know, there's so much that people have to rely on each other. To, to deal with what, what is a condition that interferes with life in a lot of different ways. Um, one, one interesting slide here that I put together was this idea that part of the reason why there might be an overlap with narcolepsy and depression is that actually they share a lot of things in common. So with depression, you get debilitating fatigue and lack of energy. Well, what do you get with narcolepsy? You get severe EDS. In depression, you get disturbed sleep and difficulty maintaining sleep. Uh, in depression, you get delusional beliefs. With narcolepsy, you can get sleep-related hallucinations. Uh, and sometimes people feel like they're going crazy or all kinds of things can happen. Um, you can get psychomotor problems. You also get psychomotor problems in narcolepsy. Um, you have problems with work and school performance. Have that too. Um, in depression, you get isolation and withdrawal from other people. Talk to a few narcolepsy patients, you'll get that same story. Um, in depression, you get appetite dysregulation. The same thing sometimes. Feelings of hopelessness. Feelings of hopelessness in narcolepsy too, especially when people go a long time without getting successfully treated. And even if they are treated, sometimes it doesn't, doesn't take things the whole way. Feelings of guilt. And, and perceived laziness. I mean, how many people who finally get diagnosed with narcolepsy spent a long time being told that they were lazy or not good enough or told themselves that, which is where some of the guilt comes in as well. I mean, so to me as a psychologist, wow, I'm not surprised that there's such an overlap just because phenomenologically they probably do overlap and they can start causing, uh, and, and it can, which is where some of this depression might come out of. So, um, I actually took out, so one of the, the tweaks I did earlier in the day was I actually had a lot more like background and slides and graphs and stuff, but I figured you wanted less of that. That was actually gonna be less help, helpful than actually talking about managing mental health. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. Uh, to my knowledge, there are no trials of a study of treating narcolepsy and say, did people's mental health get better? Maybe there is, I, I'm not as up on some of this literature. I didn't find any, I looked. Um, that would be cool to do um, for people doing research. Um, but there are a few great lessons learned from other sleep disorders. For example, treating sleep disorders often improves mental health symptoms. We know this really well in both the insomnia and sleep apnea literatures, that by treating the sleep problem can sometimes uh, feed into some of the mental health issues. 
uh, mental health treatments may be very effective and synergistic with sleep disorders treatments. They tend not to replace sleep disorders treatments, but they can be synergistic and work with them and not compete with them. So you should be getting mental health care if you need it, and it's okay. Uh, and mental health strategies useful in other chronic illness populations might be beneficial. Just because we don't have mental health approaches specifically for narcolepsy yet, maybe uh, maybe we can learn what we know about mental health and other chronic, chronic health conditions. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what some of those strategies are. Um, one, of, one thing I want to talk about first is this idea of mental health crises. And, and I'm not going to belabor this too much. This is, this is more when you're dealing with someone in crisis. What, do, what does someone like me try to keep in mind when you're face-to-face when -face -face with someone in crisis? So first of all, you want to focus on, if you want to get them out of crisis, focus on two key issues. Number one, their emotional dysregulation. And number two, cognitive rigidity. The combination of those two things, that's when, gets, when people get sort of get stuck in this tunnel and they start making choices that can be very destructive, where they, they just become very inflexible and negative. So those, so those are two dimensions to focus on. And you got to shift away. So what I would do is try and shift away from this adversarial doctor versus patient model, where, um, where the patient helps develop the plan. Uh, where you focus on the real problems that they're saying or driving suicidality or, or any negative uh, ideas that they have. Um, you want to figure out what their problems are. And, and instead of telling them, well, I think you should do this and I think you should do this, you really need to help them be developing it. So if you're dealing with someone in crisis, you know, have them help come up with the solutions. Um, also uh, consider strategies, um, especially people uh, who are high risk. Um, so some of these strategies and some of the things we're going to be talking about are mindfulness of interpersonal effectiveness, uh, managing and tolerating distress. Um, so this isn't something I'm going to be talking about much today, but the idea of tolerate distress tolerance in people who are in a crisis and learning, uh, who are in a crisis, it's a, it's a really important skill to teach, um, and also emotion regulation. Um, and you want to definitely avoid stigmatization of mental health symptoms, this idea that like, this means you're being selfish because you're focusing on yourself and what about everyone else? You know, don't do that. Um, in terms of lessons from other sleep disorders, um, you know, I did say that. Okay, so the first set of strategies I wanna talk about is something called behavioral activation. This is a set of therapies that were developed around depression. This is, this is sort of a strategy you use for people who are depressed who have trouble getting out of bed because they can't really move. I'm like, hmm, let me start with that one. Um, it's different than narcolepsy, but you know, it's the idea that, so, that you get this cycle where you have this negative mood and low energy, then you start avoiding positive things because you don't have the energy to do them, which then leads to more isolation, which then leads to worse mood and it creates this cycle. And so you know, this is common in depression. I'm like, hmm, this sounds a lot like a lot of people with narcolepsy are facing too. So what do you do for a patient like this? Well, so let me walk you through the thought process of, of, of this first. So first you've got an event. So something like becomes a sort of triggering event, which then leads to these negative feelings. This happened and I'm feeling, I'm feeling embarrassed or isolated or sad or defeated or whatever. Then what that does is that leads to actions of pulling away, isolating, or, or whatever. And then what happens, the actions, which are seen as the consequence of the feelings, start becoming the cause of the feelings. More, you become more isolated and feel more hopeless, um, which then leads to more of these negative events because you're setting yourself up for more of these negative things to happen. And so it becomes the cycle. And so the 30 second version of, of what to think about here is this idea of up behaviors and down behaviors. What are, what are, what's something, so when you're, when you're responding to a negative feeling or a negative event, what is that action you're gonna take? Is this an action that is an up behavior that, is an, that, that promotes engagement or is it a down behavior that pulls you away? And with the recognition that if you're already biased towards more of these down behaviors, you get stuck in the swamp of them and it's hard to get out of. So, so learning to recognize how am I reacting to a situation and then developing a plan of when this happens, what am I going to do? 
Am I going to lock myself in my room for three days? Or am I going to go for a, maybe go for a walk in a park or, 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 or be, be, do something that's active or something that's social that can, can be, start, can not be continuing this cycle. So this idea of an up, up behavior, an up activity versus a down activity as a concept. So I figured I'd throw that out at you. Um, so another modality, a lot of people have heard of cognitive behavior therapy. Um, the thing of the, the, the key thing to remember about cognitive behavior therapy is that it's all about this interface between thoughts, feelings, and, and behaviors where like a hundred years ago, therapy was all talking about feelings. And the more you talk about feelings, you talk about feelings and they don't change. Like feelings are really hard to change by talking about feelings. Um, this is why psychoanalytic psychoanalysis takes like years and years to end up often going nowhere. But so th th and that's where the behaviorists came in in the 50s and 60s and said, ah, feeling schmealings, we're all pigeons pressing buttons in life. Like we can train anyone to do anything. Um, and then that then that spurred sort of the the sort of the cognitive revolution in the 60s and 70s being like, well, humans actually do have a mind and feelings and they are relevant, but you can't get stuck in them. And if you want to change feelings, so like if you're feeling depressed, which then leads to thoughts of like, I'm all alone, no one understands me, nobody likes me, I, I can't connect with anybody, which leads to behaviors such as isolation and not not communicating with people um the solution isn't to focus on the changing the feeling you can't control that very much but you can control the behavior so you can say you know if you do this thing that 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 proves some of that cognition wrong you you get, gather some evidence against it so the, the cognitive behavior therapy is very much about examining these thoughts um, and behaviors not really talking about feelings very much because you can't do much about them turns out. Um, but one of my favorite aspects of cognitive behavioral therapy, the thing that, that I wanted to leave you guys with was um, cognitive distortions. Um, so these are fun because humans are irrational. We're all irrational. Humans are irrational animals, whether we like to believe it or not. Um, and we make all kinds of bad decisions all the time. And the reason is because they help us survive. The brain, I mean, the more you learn about neuroscience, the more you understand that the brain doesn't, it's like when the brain takes a picture, it doesn't save every pixel. It takes a guess of generally where people are and what's going on, and it fills in a lot of the blanks. That's, that's how the brain works efficiently. The brain um, connects dots, but only stores the dots and, and saves the instructions. And what that means is there's a lot of, there's a lot of shortcuts the brain is always taking. And usually those shortcuts are helpful and sometimes they backfire. And cognitive distortions are examples of brain shortcuts that are sometimes helpful, but end up backfiring. And by definition, they are all irrational. Every time you do one of these things, it is irrational. It is not based in reality. It is based on a construct you created in your mind. If it helps you, great. If it doesn't, point it out. Like say, oh, I'm doing this right now. So one example is black and white thinking, super common. Something is either good or it's bad. Um, there is no all black or all white. You know, something like, you know, something is either going to work or it's not going to work. This is either good or it's bad. This person's either helping or they're hurting. Like these, a lot of black and white thoughts. Don't do that. Um, Overgeneralization. Just because something happens doesn't mean it always happens. Just because it happens a lot doesn't mean it's the only thing that's possible. Always and never this is the best, this is the worst. Like those sorts of, that sort of language is always irrational. Like the, the reality, there's, reality doesn't work that way, um, usually. So if you find yourself overgeneralizing. Another, an example of, of overgeneralizing sometimes is a mental filter. A uh, mental filter is when you see, when you see a rainbow and you say, that's red and orange. Like, well, it also has other colors in it too. Yeah, yeah, but it's pretty much just red and orange. Um, it's where when you see something and you only focus on certain aspects of it. So like, oh, my day was terrible because I had this happen and this happen and this happen. Yeah, but you also had this, this, and this. Yeah, those don't count. Um, and that leads to the next one, which is discounting positive things. So like, so mental filter is, is the more broad version. Discounting positive is a version of a mental filter. People do this all the time. You, you, you probably do this more than you think. And once you start looking for these, you'll be like, shoot, I do this a lot. Not just this one, but a lot of these. 
So it's like the, the, the quintessential example is the depressed person, you say, go for a walk around the block. It's like, I don't want to go for it. Go for a walk around the block and you have to smile and wave to everybody you see. You don't have to talk to them, but you at least have to go, you know, good morning. And so when someone goes and smiles, someone waves back. Oh, they, I mean, they were just being polite. You know, like that's what you do when someone waves at you, you wave back. They didn't actually like me. They weren't, they didn't actually have any positive positivity toward me at all. They just waved. Other person you walk by, they scowled at you. Well, he must know I'm a terrible person and they hate me. Like, oh, the negative thing was correct. And the positive thing could be totally excused away. What if the, the person who scowled just stubbed their toe or whatever? They didn't even notice you were even there. Like, so, so people do this sort of thing all the time. And they do this with, with health conditions too. Um, catastrophizing or minimizing, you know, either one of these. Uh, mind reading. People think they're mind readers. Humans are not mind readers. Um, there is no data to support telepathy, um, to my knowledge. Um, but humans think they're really good mind readers. Um, this person hates me. They hate me. How do you know? I just know. I can tell. Or, you know, like people do this stuff all the time. Catch yourself mind reading. You're going to be, you're going to realize that you do it more than you think. Uh, fortune telling. People also love fortune telling. Um, this is going to, this is going to go great. This is going to go bad. This is going to work. Ugh, I'm going to have, I'm going to have an episode. I'm not going to make it through the day. Like all these statements about things that haven't even happened yet, that we're trying to predict the future. Humans suck at predicting the future. We are really bad at it. Um, we think we're better at it than we really are. And sometimes it's helpful again, but if it's holding you back, Instead of turning it from a conclusion, uh, instead of tur turning it from a self-fulfilling prophecy to a hypothesis you're going to test. Um, th and that's actually the, sort of the takeaway of cognitive therapy. Cognitive therapy, you can tell it was made by scientists. It's all about hypothesis testing. You don't know. You don't know? Gather evidence. You might actually surprise yourself. Um, control fallacies. So either direction where it's like, I, I have no control. I there's nothing I can do. There's nothing in my power. I'm... This is what happens. Actually, there might be elements of this that might be under your control. Or the opposite of, of people think that they, if, if only I could get this other person to do whatever, my life would be way, if only I could get my doctor to do this, if only I could control the situation, everything would be better. Like we, you know, we, we can't control everything. Um, just world hypothesis, you know, this is the, that we live in a world where good things should happen, like things should be a certain way. I'm going to get the shoulds in a second, but that like there's like this this grand scale of like it's all going to work out or or like I shouldn't have to do this um, or whatever. Like, well, the world is what it is. Um, shoulds and musts. Um, we whenever whenever I'm in in a session with a patient, we always like I've gotten to the point where when I hear the word should, uh, it, it raises a big red flag. Usually. So I had a supervisor once who said. When you say should about yourself, you've already decided to feel guilty. Now you're trying to find a good reason for it. Um, and when you say should about somebody else, you've already decided to resent them. Uh, and now you're just looking for a justification. Um, and I always found that very empowering where it's like, actually, you don't actually have to say should a lot. Um, there was a very, very famous and anim very animated um, famous psychologist, uh, passed away relatively recently, but um, very formative in the 50s and 60s. And, and he would talk about people shooting on themselves um, and masturbating, like things have to be, a, and, and it was very irrational. Um, oh, I already talked about change fallacy. Uh, and emotional reasoning. I put this one last. Uh, feelings aren't facts. If you learn, if anyone learns anything from cognitive therapy, it's that feelings are not facts. Um, I feel... And I feel like this is, you know, that, 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 that this is unfair. Well, is it unfair? Well, I feel that way. So people feel lots of things that aren't true. Um, I feel like you don't like me. Well, that's a feeling. Feelings aren't facts. Um, and, and this whole idea of, did you say I feel instead of saying I believe? Did you mean I think? Or did you mean I feel? Is that a feeling or is that, a, is that an actual thought that you have? And is that thought correct? Because we can, we tend to excuse feelings away and not question them. But I'm like, if you think something, you can prove it wrong. Um, and a lot of people say, I feel when they actually mean I think. Um, 
So anyway, I wanted to show these two because you'll notice you're, you, people, humans make these things all the time. Um, but a lot of people, when they get stuck with mental health issues, these end up backfiring because they set you up to fail rather than succeed. Okay, the next thing I wanna talk about for a few minutes is acceptance and commitment therapy, um, which is very different from cognitive therapy where acceptance and commitment therapy is about not changing things as opposed to trying to change your thoughts and feelings. Um, this is more like, what if you have a health condition that is not going to change and it is not going to go away and maybe you're not ever going to be able to totally fix it? Now what? Um, and so what an ACT therapist would talk about would be like, you know, start examining your problems. Things like um, what, are, what memories, worries, fears, self-criticisms or other unhelpful thoughts are you dwelling on? What are you currently doing that keeps you stuck, drains your energy, restricts your life? What emotions, feelings, urges, impulses, and sensations do you fight with, avoid, suppress, try to get rid of, and struggle with? And what situations, activities, people, and places are you avoiding? Or what have you quit, withdrawn from, dropped out of? What do you keep putting off until later? This is your problem. This is how you define your problem. And how do you deal with your problem is you focus on your values. The idea of who do you want to be? How do you want to live your life? And what is actually important to you? You know, if you're a chronic pain patient, you can still be a parent. You can still be a friend. You can still have a hobby. You know, you can still enjoy the outdoors. I mean, if you have no legs, you can still play basketball. I mean, there's, there's, just because you have a certain limitation doesn't mean you can't live according to your values. Usually there's a way. And so often people get stuck in the problem and they think they can't get there. And the thing is, is trying to find a way to live. Are you on target with living according to your values? Or are you off target? And then you make decisions based on your values, not based on your situation. Like what would a person... Who, who is a good parent do in this situation? Like, who do I want to be in this situation? Is this consistent with my values? Um, how do I live my values? And you set goals based on your values, not based on your situation, because maybe your situation isn't going to change, you know? Um, and then the idea is moving towards your values. In a world where you have unlimited confidence, what would be different? How would you act? How would you treat others differently? How would you treat personal qualities and character strengths would you develop and demonstrate? What are some important things that you stand for? Uh, what are some activities that you want to start and do more of? Uh, what are some goals that you would work towards? And, and what are the actions you'd take to improve your life? If you were had confidence that you would be able to manage whatever it is that you're trying to manage. So that's an acceptance commitment therapy approach of like how to, how to wrap it. So as opposed to how do you debunk your thoughts and test them? ACT is like, well, maybe you're not going to fix your situation now. What? Um, so fine, though, I want to end with mindfulness. Um, a lot of people have heard a lot of things about mindfulness. Um, and I think sometimes it does more harm than good. I think mindfulness is great, but I think it's sometimes taught wrong. Um, and so I'm going to end with, with a mindfulness exercise. Um, so, you know, like people talk about like focusing on your breathing, right? Um, has anyone ever been able to actually do that? I, I don't, I, I think it's very hard thing to do, especially when someone says, you know, close your eyes, focus on your breathing. And then as soon as what happens is your, your thoughts go somewhere else. I mean, if you just right now, focus on your breathing a little bit, and then immediately your thoughts just went somewhere, right? Um, where'd they go? Pay attention to where it went, redirect it back. Then it goes somewhere else. Actually, the exercise that I want you to practice is recognize you are focusing on your breathing is inherently like against human nature, where humans are focused, are, are built to focus on what they don't have, not what they have. And so our, our thoughts immediately go to, it's usually either trying to predict or control the future or change the past. That's usually one or one of those things that we go to. But what, what, I would, what I would ask you to try and do is sit a little bit. Think, not right the second, because I'm going to be done in three minutes, but, um, and it takes a little longer than that. But as soon as you sit and think with your thoughts, say, I'm going to focus on my breath. And before you're done saying that sentence, your mind is going to be somewhere. Notice where it goes. Point to it. Say, nope, come back. And then it's over here. 
Notice what you're thinking about. I'm thinking about this right now. Okay, then it's coming back. Then it's over here. What am I thinking about? And like, do that for a few minutes. It's exhausting, actually, because your mind is just doing this anyway. And what happens, and, and the point of this exercise isn't to focus on your breathing. You eventually might get good at it. But the point is to start recognizing where your mind goes, non-judgmentally notice, learn to bring it back. And what you'll eventually be able to do is get a little bit of distance between yourself and your thoughts and feelings. So like a way it was explained to me by a mentor was your thoughts and feelings are like a dog on a leash. Not a little dog, a bigger dog. In my mind, it's a bigger dog. I grew up with German Shepherds. And so like they see a squirrel, they run after it, right? And the next thing you, and if the leash is like this short, you're like in it, your heart's racing, you're, you're catching your breath, you're trying to figure, you're disoriented, you don't even know what happened and you're reacting to the situation and to get back on the path requires a lot of effort. But what if you could lengthen that leash a little bit and have it so that the dog sees a squirrel, jumps after it, and you have that second to be like, oh, you just saw a squirrel. Nope, we're not doing that today. And then you pull the leash back. And that little bit of distance is something you can get out of this mindfulness exercise because once you start getting used to noticing where your thoughts are going, you start being able to notice as it's happening sort of in life. And you're realizing that a lot of times you're reacting to stuff that you didn't even notice until afterwards. And if you can create that little bit of distance, you can be like, huh, I'm kind of stressed out. Like I'm in a really bad mood right now. Why? What am I about to be all upset about? Is this important? Do I want to ruin my day over this or no? Can I choose to go a different way? And as you build that skill, it builds a little bit of that distance, um, especially helping you gain control over how you're reacting. So that, 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 was, that was sort of the last sort of thing I wanted to leave with because I knew I'd be out of town. So thanks. And, and I really appreciate all of you. And, and I really appreciate all the work that you're doing. So thank you very much. Oh, so we have some questions. We have a little bit of time. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. If there's a question um, from someone virtually. And um, this person says she's been participating in EMDR therapy. EMDR. So, you know, okay. super, yeah, yeah. And they're finding it takes longer to process a memory because of her narcolepsy. Interesting. And when the emotions get heightened during these therapy sessions, these EMDR therapy sessions, she starts getting a narcolepsy episode. episode. So she thinks EMDR eventually helps on increasing awareness of her narcolepsy, her narcolepsy triggers and desensitizing, desensitizing these emotional feelings. So her question is, is there any research on narcolepsy and EMDR? No, uh, that I can answer quickly. Um, so there is some data on EMDR and PTSD um, that people with trauma histories. So EMDR has eye movement stuff. It's a form of exposure therapy where it, like, it teaches your body to be able to, we talked about the stress tolerance. It teaches your body to be able to experience a thought without flaring up and being able to stay a little more under control. And I can imagine any kind of work with, with, with like trauma-based therapies where you're inducing strong emotion what a cool question. I don't know of anybody who sort of looked into anxiety disorders, treatments that, that induce these strong emotions in a narcolepsy population and how either maybe it could be helpful to, to, to be able to be more mindful of where the triggers are or, or de-escalate some of them, or it might, we might need to modify these therapies a little bit to become optimally effective for narcolepsy patients. What a great question. Cool idea. I didn't even think about that. Yeah. Hi, Mike. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not a patient, but I want to thank you for your talk. It's very interesting. Oh, thank you. I was trained as a psychiatrist, and you know, so I I, I feel very strongly that that uh, and a lot of my patients, I always try to get them to do therapy for many reasons because I think it's also a little bit like exercise. Sometimes it can help you to understand better yourself and yeah. understand better your disease. So in any case, I think it's very helpful. But I had a couple of things I wanted to ask you sure. to com comment on it. One of them is you, you started your talk about the symptoms of narcolepsy that are found in many others' uh, sleep disorder. And we have a study which we submitted to psychiatric journals. And of course, they just reject it every time uh, because they don't want to listen. 
but yeah. where we found in 250,000 people, so it's not a small wow. sample, that depression and anxiety is associated with sleep paralysis about two to three times wow. more, sleep walking, night terrors, nightmares, but not just nightmares. You show a couple of a slide about nightmare bees and a dependent predictor of suicide, mm -hmm. uh, which is something that people are excited. But I, I mean, it's not just nightmares. No. It's sleepwalking. It's uh, sleep. Uh, it's sleep paralysis. It's uh, bad dreams. And this is absolutely not studied at all. Psychiatrists don't care. They don't. It's so, really frustrating. So I, I tried. You know, I tried jam up psychiatry because I thought, you know, at least I should know. And we really did all kind of very f interesting statistics because two hundred and fifty thousand people. Is not a small sample. No. So, but somehow we even that we have trouble publishing. Yeah, we um, we had similar. We had a much smaller study looking, but we also had we never were able to publish looking at it was college students and what were the predictors of hypnagogic, hypnopompic hallucinations and sleep paralysis in college students. And it was it was basically you combine the sleep disruption with stress and and it, it becomes yes. elicited. So I have that hypothesis, but I mean it's a little bit more basic than you yeah. probably. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, it's a sense that I, I think uh, it's a combination of people, which that's what our data seems to show, is some people that have very dense sleep. That's why it's often people who are younger, but like more of the hyposomnia side. And at the same time, the stress, underlying stress or something somehow wakes them up and puts them in this dissociated state yeah. that can then be either sleepwalking or can be uh, sleep paralysis or, you know, depending if they wake up in REM or non-REM. I think it's very common association with sleep. Well, this, well, uh, if, if if you're if you're willing to throw it back out, and I'm happy to beef up the discussion a little bit and try and sell it to a different job. I'll never forget. So Dan Kripke was my graduate advisor, uh -huh. and so for people who know him, he was a, another sort of leading per, a founder of the field, interesting person. But the first paper I ever wrote as a grad student, we were it was it was a, it was it wasn't on this issue it was on it was on depression and and psqi and and validation stuff and and it was the by the fourth journal that rejected it and i said oh does this mean does this mean it's not good and he's like i don't know it's your paper and i'm like well four sets of peer reviewers said they didn't like it and then he's like well did you do it right i said yep he's like do you think it adds something to the conversation i said yep he's like well you know, good science isn't what everyone agrees. Like often good science gets rejected a lot and sometimes it, it has to wait till it's time. And and yes, but there are patients around that yeah, are waiting. They need it. <laughs> and so and so, so and so the answer theory, was I put it back in. I finally got it accepted eventually. And it and it, the this paper that was rejected, it's it is now my I think my highest cited empirical paper, the one that I didn't know that anyone would like. So like, you know, I, I, I think with the, I think this needs to get out there. You should throw it out there. No, no, you're, you're don't worry. We'll get it out for sure. <laughs> but I think that's a good point. Uh, I wanted to point out one other thing okay, that cool. you mentioned that's very interesting is I think there are fundamental relationships and then I have to go because I am so talkative. I have to shut up. But I think uh, there is relationship, genetic relationship between bipolar disorder and sleepiness which are like hypersomnia that are also particular at the genetic level. Mm -hmm. And and I think there's some very interesting things to do. What we notice is we have a lot of patients, they have some degree of anxiety or depression, and it's sometimes you don't know its cause or consequence, et cetera. But my experience as a doctor, not a psychologist, but you treat the, the depression, it works. They are not depressed anymore, or they may be less anxious, but they are still sleeping right. like hell. Right. So it just somehow is different from the insomnia. You, you don't remove the insomnia when you treat the depression. Right. The hypersomnia stays. And then after you are stuck with it, and that's an interesting. And then a lot of times the psychiatrists don't know what to do with it. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Yes. Thank you so much. I know we're getting uh, hooked. There's, so, there's one more question from the audience. Okay. That, uh, uh, they're asking um, if there are any medications for the nightmares associated with narcolepsy. Uh, she's asking. Not that I know of, and I would defer to the actual psychiatrist who, uh, but I mean, the only medication for nightmares would be like prazosin and every once in a while, one of the SSRI blockers, which also they sometimes use, I know, in narcolepsy, but I don't write prescriptions. I'm a psychologist, so I, I don't want to wait. I, I don't know enough to know how best to answer that question. All right. Thank you.